Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Pfister. Uh, I'm a, a actually now former board member of uh, Board Emeritus of Connect Central Oregon. Uh, it was about a year ago at a Christmas party where somebody walked up to me. Uh, they were from the Sun River Republicans, and they had already talked to mm -hmm. Sheriff, uh, now Sheriff Elect Vanderkamp, but at that time candidate uh, Kent Vanderkamp, as well as candidate Bill Billy, and had asked them to participate in a forum, and they needed a moderator. And I don't know what happens, but I suppose after a couple of beers, you say yes to anything. So uh, that, I got roped in on that. We did our first forum, I believe it was February of uh, 2024. And uh, in that forum, I mentioned uh, that th I thought that this was really an eight to 10 month job interview between the two of you for your bosses, the voting public, to make some decisions. So congratulations on a hard fought campaign. Thank you. Uh, and congratulations on you know your impending uh, sheriff elect job and perhaps my condolences as well. Um, it's a tough job and I know you're up to it. And uh, I'm just excited as a citizen uh, to be able to get some opportunity to, t to have a little bit of a chat with you. Now I will say um, I am a citizen and I'm coming that way, but I do have some expertise. Uh, we'll talk about my uh, time on the county budget committee, which I'm still on, uh, as well as I'm the board chair for a local public safety district. So that was why they had asked me in the first place to go have a conversation. But more than anything else, you know, again, as a citizen, I'm just really interested in, you know, what you're gonna do as a, uh, as a sheriff so I fed you the first question, kind of like we did the last time. So I'll actually read it, and then hopefully that's the last question we all read today. Um, so during the campaign, you made it clear that you were running to enact some needed changes in the sheriff's office. I think that's a fair statement. Now that the voters have spoken and you've had the opportunity to assess that situation, how do you think your opinion of the office has changed? And what are some of your immediate priorities after you take that office in January? Yeah, that's a big question. So I didn't run to be the status quo sheriff. I think that's very clear. Uh, I also think that the election night was a big mandate. You know, 20% gap between the two of us. Agreed. Big numbers. Uh, that to me was a very loud and clear message that they don't want the status quo. Voters are, are wanting to see change. Uh, the change is already happening in our office. I think from election night forward, uh, the energy is vibrant right now in our office. It's, mm -hmm. it's, oh, I'd almost say they're almost vibrating with energy and excitement. Uh, so with that comes what people are hoping for change. I don't know that my opinion has changed. There's so much to do. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we need to get, become an office that does more collaborating, less listening, or less talking and more listening with our community. Uh, that's one of the first things I want to do is to get out and talk to the community and find out what it is they expect from their sheriff's office. The way people and sisters want to be policed is a lot different than Lapine or Redmond or Ben for that matter. So we need to get out and really start to collaborate with our not only our community but then our public safety partners in other agencies, not just police agencies, but fire agencies and uh, service providers and, and uh, community leaders and get all the information we can to where we can make the change that everybody wants to see. Uh, there's a lot to be done. A lot of conversations have already started mm -hmm. um, and it'll continue to go from there, I think. I don't, I don't know if there's gonna be one answer to any of that. That's fair. Yeah. It's, now, do you, you, know, you hear different forms of leadership coming in. You know, there's always the leader that says, I'm not going to touch anything for the first 100 days or the first 90 days. And there's the other one that comes in and says, well, you know, uh, who's the first person I can uh, have, have a spirited conversation with, you know, right after the swearing in. I mean, what's your, what's your general thought in terms of how you're going to do that? Uh, I'm in a unique situation since I've been in the agency for so long. Right. So I'm not a new leader from the outside that hasn't seen or heard of the things. Uh, I also have the support of the office um, a large, very large percentage, which is going to make pushing that rock up a hill a lot easier when you've got everybody helping you mm -hmm. versus trying to hold you down. So the, the conversations have already been had with internal folks about what they want to see and how they want things to be done. And there's some things that I, you know, I, I don't see needing to be done right away. Um, one of the things besides being uh, kind of looking for those opportunities is being more fiscally responsible and looking for opportunities to save money and so we don't have to go back to the taxpayers and ask for money. So getting to be fiscally responsible again is high on that list. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody wants the new and fancier toy, but we have to get to the point where we need to go on a diet for a little while and see how the dollars um, fall into, our, fall into our, our, our coffers and respect those dollars because uh, we can't do everything that we want to do right away. So um, I think there's more research to be done there, but I think being on the inside already makes that a lot easier. You know, I'm, I'm a re I'm a respect-driven leader, uh, meaning that 
um, in law enforcement, I think it's important that we respect everybody and we respect each other and we respect ourselves, but most importantly is respect the profession. Uh, and as long as we use that as our driving force, I think we'll be successful. And, and how do you drive that respect in the first place? I mean, it's like, I've worked for some guys, that, in fact, I remember uh, one of my favorite VPs that I ever worked for in high tech, he was a guy that just craved your respect. I mean, you could just see it every time he would, he would talk. He would say something, say it with confidence, and then look at you and, and he'd go like, are you okay with that? I mean, it, yeah. how, do you, how, do you, how do you think you drive that respect, especially out of the smaller constituency that uh, maybe wasn't in full support of you to start? Well, I think respect is earned. Uh, I've also, being on the inside, that helps too because they, they as an organization have seen me lead and seen how I've, I've been a guiding force for a lot of things. But I think providing opportunities internally, uh, that was a big problem that we had was nobody felt heard mm -hmm. in our office. They felt silenced. So being able to listen and have conversations, you know, I've probably talked to nearly 100 employees before I even was elected where people wanted to come and just be heard. Mm -hmm. And it was almost therapeutic for them to be able to say, hey, nobody's listened to my ideas or my thoughts or what's bugging me about the office. So I had a lot of time to, to kind of digest and, and hear a lot of it. But to, you can, you'll never win by demanding respect. That, that's never mm -hmm. worked. Uh, but earning it and providing opportunities, I think is what people are really hoping for. And that's what we've already started doing in the office today. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunities for people to better themselves. I believe in mentoring and teaching rather than commanding and instructing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's paid dividends already. Well, that's a cultural thing as well. I mean, it's, it's, you, can't, you can't be the only mentor to a large organization. You really have to find the people that are willing to be the mentors and, and find ways to be able to put them not only in the position, but give them the expectation that they need mm -hmm. to be able to teach and impart that new culture that you're trying to establish. And that will be nearly mandated with my command staff is mm -hmm. that our goal will be to, um, to find people that are up and comers and to mentor and teach and bring them to the next level rather than hold people down uh, because we need to bring people up mm -hmm. into the ranks. I'm not gonna be doing this forever. My command staff won't. We already have a series of retirements coming and it shows yeah. you that one generation's on their way out and new one's in and we need to kind of embrace this younger generation and bring them up into law enforcement and teach them the priorities of, of being that respectful servant leader. It's a, and that was an observation I was, uh, that I was gonna make from the outside so we can, we can talk about it now. Um, obviously there are a lot of people that were already nearing retirement age. Uh, one of the last negotiations, there was an opportunity for people that were close to it to be able to get health care that would bridge them all the way to 65. Right. So you did see a lot of the senior people start to think about, ah, it's time to, it's time to leave. The, the ones you're probably happy with right now are the ones that are like, yeah, I was ready to leave and now's the time for me to leave. And it you know, might be you, it might not be you, but uh, either way, they're, they're on their way out and you know it. There's then kind of the next level of, well, I'm on the way out, but I haven't decided when that's gonna be yet. And that's one thing to address. But then the others are, I'm not ready to leave. Um, either, whether, I'm, whether I'm available to leave or not, I, I'm not ready to leave it's encouraging them to say, okay, you need that burst of energy that convinces you you want to right. stay. I mean, you've kind of already lost the people. I, I, don't, I guess I could make a retired in place joke, but we don't need to do that. Um, but there's some people that's like, well, okay, I need to manage that very carefully. But you know, it's imparting that energy to the, to the people that are right. on the fence and, and want to go. What's your, what's your thought there? Well, we have 200 and 59 employees, we're budgeted for 275, so we're mm -hmm. still short-staffed. So we need that talent and we need that experience to stay as long as we can so we can fill those those ranks. But we have so much talent in our office, in the correction side and on the patrol side, uh, to tap into that, um, again, bringing that opportunity and bringing that next generation up, I think it will be a priority for not only my, my administration, but future administrations, especially uh, as these waves of retirees mm -hmm. continue to go. Uh, one of the things I've been a big proponent of is finding that talent and bringing that talent up. Maybe, they, maybe a corrections deputy wants to be a patrol deputy. We've never really given them that clear path to come over to become right. a patrol deputy. And I think by um, opening that path and bringing people over from the ha that side of the house to the patrol side, uh, or even non-sworn jobs and having, we have great talent in the non-sworn section too. Um, but there's so much that I think we can still do in-house to grow that I, I'm hoping that um, we don't need to go outside and find people for the next 20 years. I, I think we've got so much talent inside 
uh, we'll be able to grow and find good leadership inside. We already have leaders that are just jonesing to come up and become the next generation. So uh, now's the time to develop that talent. Do, do you view that as a blend? Uh, you know, you don't obviously need to play your hand uh, any, anywhere one way or another, but are you planning on looking outside to try and bring in some, not only senior, but some experienced staff at lower levels to mm -hmm. help change the culture inside? I have. Um, so you're, you're already working on that. But then that's that delicate balance of, okay, I can bring in, but if I bring in too many senior people from the outside, I'm discouraging my people from the inside thinking, well, okay, maybe I don't have an opportunity to move up. It is a fine balance. Uh, I have sought out a, a couple of command staff level people from the other agencies. I've made uh, an offer to one. I'm just waiting for them to finish the, the background process mm -hmm. before I'll make an announcement. But uh, you're right, it is, a, it is a fine balance. And again, we have so much talent, I like to say, but we also have that generational gap where my strongest talent might be in one division of the house. And if I pull all that talent out of there, then I've got no, no experience in, for example, like the detective division, um, what do you do? So you have to find that balance of a little bit from here, a little bit from there, but that cultural change, you have to be very particular about who you bring in. Right. I always describe it as like a fish tank. I've, I've owned fish tanks in my life and you bring in one bad fish and they kill all the others with a disease and you don't want that. So mm -hmm. you want to find somebody who really um, believes in your vision as the sheriff and be able to send that message to the troops. And I think I found that in the person that I've, I've made the offer to. So hopefully in the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks, I'll be able to, to announce that. But I think that experience will, will be key to our cultural change. Mm -hmm. It's, and on that, um, it, when we were talking in February, we actually did t uh, talk about the subject of, we were in that one, we kind of focused under, on underrepresented employees. Uh, specifically, we were talking about women in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the general feedback that I got from that forum over the next couple of months was that both you and your, uh, and your opponent had kind of worked that question. So um, thinking about it, and it sounds like you really have thought about it a little bit, um, what are you going to do uh, to appeal to the whole audience? I mean, it's one thing to say, I have a select set of people that I know I can pull into the sheriff's office, but now all of a sudden, if I can open that up to another 20 or 30 percent of the population or 40 percent of the population, I've, I've just got a bigger pool to fish from. I mean, what, what are your thoughts there? Are we talking specifically about women? Big women, underrepresented minorities. I mean, all, all the way around. It's in. I'll even preface that. I remember a few years back there was a, a kid, young lady that I worked with. She's now a very successful engineering manager at a software company. She was doing an interview at what I thought was a fantastic company, and she turned them down. They wanted her really, really bad, and she turned it down. And I asked her why, and she said, because the whole time I interviewed and I walked through the building, I didn't see anybody or anything that I could relate to. Mm -hmm. So this isn't, you know, fill a quota or do anything else. It's, it's have, have a woman or a <coughs> Hispanic person or a black person walk in and go, okay, I can relate to that. Sure. And, I, and, I, and that helps me make a change. I mean, is, it, is that something you've thought of? Oh, it has. I mean, I, I've, I'm a girl dad. I have two daughters, uh, and I'm married to a Hispanic woman, so I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the word borked, though. You have to give me that definition no. later. But uh, Technical term. <laughs> I, uh, I, I do see that. I feel it. And, and we're in a profession that really is male-dominated mm -hmm. and finding uh, women that want to take on leadership roles within law enforcement are not many. Mm -hmm. So the, the ones that I think uh, are out there are already posted up in another agency, so getting them to come over to you is hard. You don't want to get into so, a competitive fight. It's like, you well, I'll offer you more money to do this, or I'll offer you, you to don't. do this. But I, do you, have you reached out to them just to ask them if they're open to talk just so that you can get an experience oh, in I terms have. of what to look for? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've been in conversation with uh, a deputy chief in Washington State who's given me some great advice mm -hmm. and where to look and, and how to look. And um, I've had some conversations with some women that are in the community now for non-sworn leadership positions. So that's key to, I think, our success because it does bring balance to the office, not only um, culturally speaking, but also in terms of growth because they, they will generally have a different opinion or thought mm -hmm. on how to, do, uh, how to tackle a project. Or maybe they have a different talent than a sworn position would have. So uh, there's so much searching to do in that area. And, and I'm hoping, uh, because I have posted leadership positions now for my uh, my uh, administration I'm hoping to see some women apply mm -hmm. um, in fact I, I'm confident there'll be at least three or four that I know of that will and and I hope that uh, they're successful in that 
that processing that will take place. And again, even if you see them applying, that gives an opportunity for people to relate to. And it's and it's again, it's not you know, oh, I must see this or I must do this. It's just I want to see that there's an openness to change. Oh yeah. And maybe that's not an openness to change that they've seen in this existing department in the past or in other departments that they've worked in in the past. I mean, well, a, you're right. It's a male dominated culture. It, again, I come from tech and and back well even today it's still pretty male dominated and it's just it's really tough for people to see relevance or see a place in there so anything that you can do on that is always a good opportunity well and there's a there's an organization now uh women in law enforcement here in central oregon mm -hmm. uh it's run by a commander over in the red and pd and she's done a really good job of mentoring young women mm -hmm. in the profession and i'm hoping with their help too that we'll be able to identify talent and and have them come join uh, because it, we're really it's, it's it's a movement what we're seeing in our office right now it's the first time in 20 something years that uh, we've changed the culture just by an election mm -hmm. so now we're getting a lot of attention from outside agencies and other deputies and officers and troopers who are saying hey what's going on over there we hear good things so i'm hoping that i can draw draw in from that yeah a 20 percent win is a is a pretty significant thing i mean having done a couple of votes in deschutes county not personally but participated in them uh, Fifty-five, forty-five is a is a is a pretty big win. Sixty, forty is a that is a statement that says it is. we really want something that's going to change, and you know you have an opportunity to be that change agent. Uh, the nice thing is, as fast as you can be a savior, you can also end up being on the being on the wrong side if you're if you're making those missteps. And but that's something that at least in our the interactions that we've had, you seem to relish that challenge. Well, I did survive the last 12 months of a gnarly street fight style campaign. So uh, I've got bloodied up pretty good and I made it this far. So yes, I would agree that I think I'm in it to win it. Mm -hmm. So now that you're here, um, I'm sure that you've started to talk about, you talk to some of your peers. I mean, you know, obviously you've got a couple of very large agencies in Bend and Redmond. There's mm -hmm. some other county agencies in uh, Jeff County and Crook County. Uh, and then a lot of the smaller agencies that are, uh, that are in the area. Um, have you started to reach out to your peers in that? I mean, I, I, if I remember, you used to go to Coles and sit in the meetings, sorry, Central Oregon Law Enforcement uh, right. meetings. You used to go in, but you've, you've never really sat at the table there. Now you're about to sit at that table. Have you reached out to some of those other seats to have that yeah. chat? Yeah, no, we've, we've connected with several of them. Uh, some I've been talking to through the campaign. Right. Uh, some of them I had support from that were giving me good advice and in, in different directions. So. The conversations have started, yes. Uh, I was already working with a lot of them because Code, Central Oregon Drug Enforcement, sure. was working in their jurisdictions or we were supporting their jurisdictions. So I was already interacting with a lot of the heads of those agencies. So I had a relationship already. Uh, many of them are excited too, to see what mm -hmm. we do over here and to see the changes that I'm gonna bring. Um, some of them, uh, I think, are still uh, in awe of the election just because of how commanding it was. Uh, but no, we've already been in conversation with them. I've already been talking to uh, constituents and, and some friends at uh, DHS, for example, the homeless uh, providers, um, mm -hmm. Latin to community, community associations. So those conversations have already started and they've continued. Uh, it's only been, what, a month now, maybe a little shy right. of a month. So uh, it seems longer and it does seem longer at the same time. So a lot of those conversations have already started, but then of course, trying to get through a transition period now internally has also been a priority because uh, my time is going to be limited with the current administration who's exiting uh, at the end of the end of this month. So mm -hmm. it's a hard balance to have these conversations and still focus on your to-do list. So, you know, it's going to be a new sweep too. And it's, you know, I, um, I, you know, the current administration are people that I know and, and appreciate, and I think they've done a reasonable job in terms of public safety here. You are coming in, but it is going to be a pretty abrupt uh, change. And it's not even a malicious thing. It's just more, there's things you forget right. as you walk out the door. And right. so you're going to, you know, there's probably going to a lot of Easter eggs that you're going to be finding as you trip through the building the, the oh, yeah. first couple of months. Yeah. They, the, the current administration has been very generous with their time. Uh, it's been very cordial, very nice to have their ear to find mm -hmm. the answers to these questions. But you're right. Once you cross one thing off your list, three more come on your list. So it's, it's a losing battle at the moment, just trying to keep up with your to-do list. Uh, but I suspect we'll have all the big, the big projects um, mm -hmm. identified and, and ready to go when January 1 comes. Yeah. Now, in addition to the voting public, you, uh, your real bosses, uh, as, as uh, the existing sheriff would say, 
Um, you were, you had two other bosses that went out of their way to uh, endorse you, uh, Commissioner Zadar and Commissioner Chang. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's pretty fair to say that when the two of them agree on something, that's it's not rare. only pretty rare, but it's also pr probably a pretty strong trajectory. So have you had chats with them as well as with Commissioner DeBone in terms of what some of their expectations are with the office? We've had conversations. I don't know that I could identify expectations. I think people recognize who I am at county, downtown county. Uh, so they, they're already excited just to see the change and, and that relationship come mm -hmm. back together. I think the relationship has been broken for many years. Uh, so I think the commissioners and, and the county administrator and county legal are, I think they're happy to have everybody sit down together and, and have conversations mm -hmm. and, ha and build that relationship because we've kind of been on an island for a while. But uh, yeah, and, and in fact, that was what I was just going to say. It was, silo was the word I was going to use, but we could do island. I mean, there were a lot of services that the sheriff's office had within it. Um, the, the finance control was pretty tight in there. The mm -hmm. legal uh, was also very tight in there. Are you trying to break some of those walls or, or is the county trying to break some of those walls for you to try and get get you the availability of the resources that are already there for you? They are. We've, I've sat down with uh, a lot of the key players at downtown county. Uh, we are likely to, to um, I want to say disband, but mm -hmm. defund our, our legal department in the sheriff's office and downtown county will then take that over. Uh, same, I don't know about finance. We haven't made a plan there, but yes, we're, we're going to come back and use the services that we've been paying for. That's mm -hmm. part of the problem I've always had is We've at the sheriff's office been paying for downtown services, but not using them, and then paying for our, our own ancillary services. Uh, so we're going to go back to using the services that we're already paying for, that are bought and paid for. So yeah, uh, internal service fees I exactly. is, what, is what we call them from the budget perspective. Yes. And uh, those ISF services, they start <laughs> taking a pretty hefty amount of uh, of your time, and you start to look and go, wow, you know, am I really getting my value for what I'm for what I'm being charged? Sure. And so that's a, I mean, it's just more an opportunity than anything else, especially when the budget is going to be something that uh, is going to get uh, a pretty hard look. And uh, I, I should say at this point, uh, I am a member of the county budget committee. I'm actually currently the county budget chair. Um, I should read my little disclaimer. Um, I do not have, I do have a vote, uh, vote in the oversight of all county budgets, including the sheriff's office. But to be clear, I don't get to make individual decisions on, the, on any budget. It's presented to me, and as a representative of the citizens, um, I get an opportunity to say yes or no, or, or ask questions right. on that. And uh, uh, the county budget committee has, it has asked some hard questions of the sheriff in recent years, at least the time that mm -hmm. I've been on it. And I remember, I think it was one of the first times you and I met for coffee, you had just picked up a copy of the sheriff's budget. And, I, and if I remember the question you asked me is, what should I be looking for? And uh, my comment back was, um, we'll read the summary, read the details, and then go back and read the summary and realize what's not being said. Right. So yeah, you probably had an opportunity to do that a couple of times. What's mm -hmm. your initial take on uh, the budget? You've already talked about one thing about, well, you know, the sheriff's hitting a, hitting a pretty good budget number, but a lot of that's vacant personnel. It is. Yeah, it's a lot of vacant personnel. And that'll be the first area, obviously, is to figure out what roles we can fill quickly uh, without harming the rest of the budget. Uh, I think that there's some spending that we could probably look at a little tighter. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of third party service contracts that I think are unnecessary uh, that have probably caused our office more grief than, than anything. So I think there's going to be lots of the money to be saved in the service contracts and then looking in to see how we're spending money day to day or just our operational cost. People are very expensive. Uh, they're probably the most expensive. But they're, they're the for most any expensive agency. and they're the largest portion of your budget. Well, actually, it's not the people; it's the burden around the people, the health care, the right, well, uh, the, and all the rest. Still falls in the same duck. Your your people are your most expensive, but I also think they're the best investment you can make, and especially Absolutely. in a public safety agency. Uh, so I don't have a problem with investing in people as long as it's well spent money. Um, but I think we need to look at the, the the cost of doing business and what we're spending our money on internally. Is some of that necessary? And uh, you know, we're we need to look at bigger things right now. Our office is getting tight. Mm -hmm. We're, I think, our, our main office building now is uh, we're busting at the seams, and we're going to have to look at some ways that we can grow that, and whether it be expansion, or we extend a different campus, or what that looks like. But that's something for the future. I don't think that we will be able to stay all stay in that same building in the next ten years. I think we're going to outgrow it quickly. Um, so that's something I'm looking at is how we can do that effectively and efficiently as we can without asking taxpayers for more money. 
I don't know what that looks like just yet, but that's one of the things that's on my list of things to do. Um, but the budget is going to be the first thing I dive into and, and bringing in some people with good eyeballs to look at that and figure out how we can do things more effectively. But like mm -hmm. I said, we're going on a diet. It's, I mean, the, the diet the, is the good start, and the, but there's the nutrition aspect that comes into mm -hmm. it in terms of feeding it. And, uh, um, you know, vehicles tend to be, just as an example, tend to be a, a, a pretty expensive part of what it is that you're doing. Um, and then there's been actually a fair amount of variability in the last couple of years. I think it was two years ago in the sheriff's budget, there were in the range of, I won't get the number right, but 50 new vehicles. Mm -hmm. Last year, there were in the range of 10 new vehicles. That's a great trend, um, but at some point or another, you have 50 aging vehicles that need to be replaced, and that's a that's a multi-year budget thing that you've got to be able to swallow. I, I call it the lump and the snake. Sometimes you it is yeah, it's yep. a lump. It's you got to work your way through, and yep. the results of it working through aren't necessarily the nicest thing. Well, we did have a surplus of cars, which I think artificially created that that 10 number mm -hmm. uh, that we were kind of working our way through. Um, but I think extending yeah. the life on some of those cars too, because we've been um, I think taking them out of service a little bit earlier than I would take them out of service. Uh, so I think we can get another year or two out of them, but to make that lump move a little bit slower. Well, and then you, there's additional service and support. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a whole, it you is. know, we can play slinky too. It's the, it's the whole aspect of, well, where's this going in my budget? I mean, you know, I'm glad that you're really thinking about, well, what are some of the various solutions that we can try? Because you're going to be throwing three or four at the wall, probably mm -hmm. trying to figure out which one of them is going to stick the best. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's just one aspect. I mean, there's continued need for training, and especially if you're bringing in new people to the organization, right. um, you have to train them up to the standards of, the, of your organization. And you know, you're probably also thinking about different organizational standards that you want to drive as well. Indeed. So that's a, you know, some of those things end up being, well, I'd love to be able to cut that in the budget, but I can't because. Right. Um, and you know, there's only so much that you can get out of saying, well, you know, can you wear your uniform a little longer? Can you keep your boots a little longer? Or other things like that. It's going to, I mean, it's a challenge, and I'm, and I'm glad you're really thinking that you want a lot of eyes on it rather than a few eyes on it. Um, what's the, you know, what is your take? Have you had uh, comments with, the, or have you had conversations with the finance staff already? You know, not only the sheriff's office finance staff, but also you said you haven't really talked to county finance much. We've had some conversations. Uh, right now, we're we're going to do an audit. The mm -hmm. audit, the the transition audit, has already launched. Um, so once I be an internal county audit, it is okay. Yep. So I'm hoping to have that back in my in my hands probably soon after I take office, and that will give me at least some direction mm -hmm. of where I need to pay some attention. Uh, our finance staff needs more support. They are uh, our accounts payable, accounts receivable of. They're just falling behind because they're short staffed. So mm -hmm. we need to get them back up to where we can get accurate numbers because your data is only what's in your system. And so we have a lot of numbers that are not mm -hmm. inputted yet. So to see that data is not complete, I want to see complete data. Uh, but once we get that caught up and I think we figure out where those sources are of saving money, mm -hmm. uh, we can put those in action relatively quick. And then from there, we can look at our long-term projections, um, looking at grant opportunities for traffic enforcement, uh, you know, we have a digital forensics lab right now that's used by most everybody in the county and then beyond. We get requests from other counties and federal mm -hmm. agencies uh, and looking at how we can make that more of a task force and, and bringing in other revenue from it because right now we're solely uh, committed to that. We, we're housing that as well. Uh, and then having a major traffic investigation team, kind of like we do with major crimes now. We mm -hmm. share resources in the Tri-County area. I think we need to go back to doing that with some of our crash investigations and bringing a true traffic team into force. But if, again, that takes people. Uh, and so once we figure out where we can make those needs fulfilled more quickly, that's what we'll do. But for now, we're kind of figuring out where all the chips lie. So you got code, you got cert, now you got caught. So Yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> now, you've, got, you've also got a couple, uh, I, think, I think you've got two labor unions inside your, or is it just one? It's just one. Inside. Yeah. And, uh, and is the contract coming up soon? It is. Yep, it'll be this year. Um, that's, you know, and again, that's always the fun thing to do as a, uh, you know, as a brand new executive coming in and, and coming in. Now, you've been part of the union as a sergeant at this point, right? I was part of the union as a deputy as well. Okay, yeah. And then I was out of the union for about six or seven years. That's true, because the sergeant's just recently And just came recently back came back in. back in. 
Uh, yeah. So, so how do you make that transition? I mean, you've been out, so you've got some experience, but how do you make that transition to the executive rather than to the labor side? And, and how does that influence your thoughts on the negotiations? You know, if anything, it gives you perspective. I think having that perspective of not only being a member of the union, but understanding what's important to them is equally as important to know what's important to the agency and to the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. uh, our union generally doesn't have strong differences. Uh, it always comes down to money, but right. it's, it's generally nothing really barbaric. We can usually talk through a lot of it. Historically, sheriffs have not had a lot of pushback with the association in terms of contracts. Um, needs usually get met one way or the other. So I don't think it's going to make that big of a difference. I have a relationship mm -hmm. with the board, both professionally and some uh, outside the office. So we know, I think we understand each other and mm -hmm. we understand each other's mannerisms and, and we know how to have conversations. And that's, again, goes back to being respectful and having conversations, but I don't expect it to be um, all that difficult. I think it'll be a pretty simple process compared to what else is waiting for me. Well, that's true. I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting because you're not the only labor negotiation going on in law enforcement, uh, you know, in the time frame, and, uh, you know, in other contexts, uh, there's been some speculation on, well, who's going to go first and how, and how are they going to go? And, uh, you know, and, and what numbers are they going to produce? It's, uh, you know, the district that I'm in is like the district that you're in, uh, the rates are ceiling at this point, the, the property tax rates. So your growth is really the growth of the, of the region that supports you. Right. Um, you're a little luckier in that in that factor than mine, but that probably still says in the four, maybe five percent range, you're covering increased contracts, you're covering uh, uh, you know increased expenses overall, you're covering you know increased costs, uh, just general inflation, and then you're trying to fit in any union increases that are going in there at right. the same time. And I don't expect assessed values to go up. I think that this is probably going to be our last year of growth, and then we're going to see a plateau mm -hmm. at least for the next couple of years. We'll see what this next uh, presidential administration does for the markets, but I suspect the values of properties are going to probably plateau the next two two cycles. Yeah, so. I mean, most of the growth is really coming in the build out, and right. uh, you know, again, which I don't see in my district, but uh, but you do see it being county wide. But even that build out is limited. I mean, the, there's not a you know there are limitations to the urban growth, and uh, and that you know does get absorbed. So I mean, it's it's. It's another factor to go factor in right. as you're as you're doing it, and it's and you're not the only one. I mean, you know, it's when you come into budget committee, I'm sure I'll slap you on the shoulder and say, "Yeah, you too, buddy." So, <laughs> um, what what else do you think? I mean, in terms of uh, oh, I, I guess I, I should ask on that. One of the other things that the sheriff has been, in, at least in recent years, from a budget perspective, is trying to draw on additional revenue sources outside of the uh, two sheriffs' lobbies. Uh, notably t uh, transit room tax or TRT. Um, at one point, I, in fact, I think at a couple of points, I heard you say that TRT wasn't necessarily a direction you wanted to pursue long term. Have you changed your mind on that? Well, I haven't. I think uh, when you're planning your future, I think transit room tax is not what you hang your hat on. I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to be consistent. Uh, I'm worrisome that it could go away or we could change. I mean, it's, there's all sorts of things. But yeah. It reminds me of the lumber days. And I think by being so dependent on something that's variable and inconsistent is not good business. I think there there was a really nice spike uh, in train well in countywide transient room tax during uh, during COVID. the pandemic yeah. um, because people were flocking to kind of unincorporated less dense right. areas, which was a big boon in TRT. But now that is plateauing out and in fact declining a little bit in the right. last couple of years. And uh, I think that's that's been a shock to the system for quite a few organizations. It has, and the economy had a lot to do with that. Right. The cost of living changed and a lot of people weren't taking vacations or visiting family members in other areas. And I think that that's a great point to why we shouldn't be dependent on it. Mm -hmm. I think that it's great to have that as extra money or maybe project funds, but to try to run a day-to-day -day operation and hope that you're going to get that transit room tax is, is dangerous. Yeah. And I promise if you change your mind and you come into a budget meeting, I won't call you. <laughs> so I'll always ask for money. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, I don't know that I want to run my day-to-day -day on that. I always joke how does a nonprofit shake hands and you know you do that so maybe it's the same way with the uh, with the government. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, we we talked a little about recruiting and retention, uh, recruiting and retention motivation. Um, I was going to see if there's anything else that I that I had on that. Um, what I guess the one thing we really haven't talked about is as you hire, no matter what. I mean, even if you're looking at you know 20 sworn positions or so that are potentially going to open up. 
I, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I'll use the non-technical term of there's going to be a general sloshing of law enforcement all through the Tri-County region probably, probably as, you know, maybe some people are like, well, maybe the sheriff's office isn't the place for me anymore and, and I can go elsewhere. But then that's going to create openings that are going to come in. Do you view that as good? Do you view that as just a thing? I mean, you know, it's, I would say that it, it can be a good thing to be a bad thing or it can just be the thing that's happening. Well, I don't think any law enforcement agency anywhere right now is using the word sloshing. Uh, I think, if anything, they're rather thin. Uh, everybody's struggling to recruit and retain. You know, it's, it's a hard profession. Mm -hmm. Look at the last four years. It's, it's, it hasn't been an easy profession, and it's really hard for recruiting when you're asking for young people to commit to a career in law enforcement. Um, then you have people who commit to it, get into it, and realize, hey, this isn't for me, or it's hard on my family, uh, and they, they change careers. Or there's the old fashioned, hey, I'm gonna, I wanna go live somewhere else, my family wants to live somewhere else, or maybe something happens in the family unit and they have to go different ways. Uh, you're always gonna have that attrition. I mean, they're human beings. They're gonna, they're gonna do different things with their lives. Uh, so I think we're already prepared for that. The hard part is, is trying to stay on top of it, right? You can't really forecast that, so you can't um, have backups waiting. You have to start a process, which when you hire a police officer from let's say from application to getting them on the road is almost two and a half years about, uh, depending from how long right, your background process is. Time in the right. So you're already behind the eight ball by two, let's just say two years for easy, for easy math. Um, how do you plan for that? You, you, you can't really. So you just have to take the hits as they come. Um, but I think to prevent or to hold that retention to prevent people from leaving is you make it a place people want to be. Mm -hmm. And that's my main mission is to make it a place that people want to be in, and felt needed and wanted and respected. And I think that that's what we're going to bring. And I, if anything, I think we'll probably see more people come to us rather than us looking for them. I think we're going to have a lot of people who are going to feel the energy of our office and want to come, come work there. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 the energy is a good start spot. And then also the region really does help. Uh, it does. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, especially in the sheriff's office where you're uh, patrolling a lot of the rural areas. I mean, that's a driver's seat with a view for, uh, for a lot. And that is attractive to people who are in larger metropolitan areas that maybe they don't want to uh, be in as much anymore and other things to be able to come here. And then you run into the cost of living now. That's a big problem. And uh, is, that a, is that something that you think you'd budget for in terms of recruitment and retention to, to try and bring them in? Or are you really trying... Are you really, is it a mix of strategies to, to see how you can pull them? Well, that was gonna be a, it's going to be a mix. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't throw money at it for so long. It's still an expensive place to live. But I think providing the option of having staff or deputies live outside the county, mm -hmm. the current administration has done that for a couple of deputies. But I think making that more readily available to say, hey, I know Deschutes County is expensive, but there's three counties around us that are not as expensive and figuring out a way that we can make that work for the for the employee. It's hard, especially as a young person coming out of the military or college or the parents' home into a career, asking them to pay $2,000, $2,500, $3,000 a month right. in rent, uh, or buying a house where the average medium housing price is now seven eighty dollars something. Uh, it's not easy. Right. Um, so you're gonna have, we're gonna have to get creative, whether that is in the form of money or finding a way to make schedules that, that work our schedule is, is probably one of the least attractive things mm -hmm. for young people and for laterals. Uh, we're working two day shifts, two night shifts, you know, 12 hour shifts, mm -hmm. asking the human body to work two day shifts and then come back to work the next day and work two night shifts. Bodies weren't designed to do that. And then giving them four days off and in reality is when a deputy comes off of a four day or off of the four day work week, the first two days you're sleeping or trying to feel human again. So in the end, you got two days. Uh, it's not good, it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. And so looking for alternative schedules that will make it more attractive is also important. Because that is, that's one of our biggest weaknesses. So that'll be it's something pretty immediate. Where you'll, you'll it's, on, it's high on the list, yes. I mean, any other immediate policy changes that you're, that, you know, that, that policies you've looked at that you think don't change? There's a number of them. Some of them uh, I'm working through with legal to ask you know, how to questions or how do we do this effectively. And, uh, there are some, I, I know some of the ones that people are, are energized about are a tattoo policy and whether that they can, they haven't been able to show tattoos and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So we're, we're working through that. I'm looking through some of our neighboring agencies that have a little bit more liberal, 
um, tattoo policy, for example, and this is a, a totally a minor policy. Well, but, uh, it's very, but it's really important. I mean, again, it's, it's that cultural it and is. that cultural relevance piece. It is, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it doesn't cost anything. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that's easy. Uh, I think it has high returns for little in, little expense. So mm -hmm. we're going to look at that. Um, but there's a number of policies that we're going to go through. In fact, I'm looking at centralizing uh, the policy programming with a, a, an outside company that does it, Alexapol. Okay. So looking at doing that, it's the, the, it's the agency that I that I work with has had pretty good success on that. You should you should talk to them. I've I was surprised by that. There's very few agencies in our area that don't. Uh, use Lexapol, us being one of them. So I'm looking at that. I think that uh, that will help a lot with that and staying on top of best practices and, and making sure that we're doing what everybody else is doing in the industry mm -hmm. uh, and in the profession. So, um, and maybe you'll let the WD surf any website they want on their spare time? As long as it's not at work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're, our business is outside, not inside. Right. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's going to be liberal. I don't think we're going to do that. We won't be that liberal. Uh, but I think we need to, off duty, they can do whatever they want. Uh, but I think internally we need to look at that pretty heavily and figure out the best way to, to attract that. Because between, uh, you know, we have great features too, like take-home cars, right. uh, letting deputies start work from their home, uh, all great features. But the scheduling is the one that I probably lose interest right away as soon as I talk about scheduling with other officers. Well, yeah, but I... I've heard it a few times, not only from your agency, but from outside agencies going, can you, can you believe they do that? So that's, you know, I think looking at that is probably going to be something that's going to excite the team pretty well. Well, it will. I, I think that and the association is, is also behind it. So mm -hmm. the association uh, obviously wants to have a voice in it, and I think they should. And I think we should have uh, conversations with everybody that, because the jail's on the same schedule, the, the correction staff, oh, wow. and figuring out, too, what, what's a good schedule for them. Uh, they have a, a little bit more in terms of bodies, but um, I'd like to have as many bodies as we can because the more bodies makes that schedule easier to do when you start changing it to multiple shifts or things like that. Well, but and start saving your overtime budget and a lot of the other things. I you mean, do. It's a, it's a balance that you got to do. It's a lot like creating a fantasy football team. Like you're constantly moving pieces around and you're trying to figure out what the best team is and how to use your players. And so that'll take, I think, probably at least a few months to get something in place there. But that's high on the list. As a person with three or four fantasy football teams, I suck at fantasy football, <laughs> but I still love doing it. So I get the end. You under, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we take a couple minute break, though, give you a chance to get some water and all the rest. And then, you know, we'll come back and through the magic of uh, video in a, in a second here and uh, move forward. Excellent.